a pioneer in breaking down barriers in journalism, up next on Carpe Diem. I'm Meryl Brown, Director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Joining me today is an award-winning journalist with over 40 years in the news business, Lynn Povich. In 1970, Lynn was one of the 46 female Newsweek employees who filed an historic claim with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, suing the magazine for sex discrimination for a policy of only allowing men to be hired as writers and reporters on the magazine and women as researchers. The women eventually won, and by 1975, Lynn became Newsweek's first female senior editor. Lynn is here today to talk about her inspiring career, as well as her book, The Good Girl's Revolt, a retelling of that landmark lawsuit and the impact it has left for women in the media world. Her book has been adapted as a widely anticipated new show now available on Amazon Prime. Welcome, Lynn. Thanks, Meryl. It's great having you here at Montclair State, and just for the record, you're going to be back in November to talk to our students as well. So. Thank you for participating. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. So it's ironic that this book would come out at a moment in time when uh, issues of gender are very much in the national political debate, talked about in the media. Is that a sad or happy coincidence? Well, actually, I think it's good that the issues are part of this debate. And uh, we knew that we might have a woman running for president, and some of that would come up. But the way in which it's come up and how it's come up has been a bit surprising. But I think it's been great that people now understand that a lot of the issues that we fought for 40 years ago are unfortunately still here uh, and maybe getting worse in some ways. And it is similarly ironic that we're talking about this not necessarily in the context of the election of what is likely to be the nation's first female president, but in the context of an entirely different storyline, if you will. Yes, and, and yes, I think Hillary's issues were, are very important for women and always have been, and we knew that the issues she's worked on for most of her life were going to come up. What we didn't anticipate was the kind of discrimination and bias that's, that still many women face was really going to become the center almost of the, of the discussions we're having now. And I should show the book, which is a great book and came out a couple of years ago. It is now a TV show. What prompted you many years after the book was actually written to? Well, you know, I, I really, I was a history major in college and I believe that people should understand their history. And I found that a lot of young women, including my daughter, um, really don't know what, the, what it was like for women in the days that we were working as young women. Um, and the kind of foundations that have been laid for the rights we fought for and the lives they're living now. A lot of people knew that women at the New York Times had sued for sex discrimination, but actually the women at Newsweek were the first. And so for historical reasons, or just for my own family, I thought, I want to write about this history and to show how these young women, we were in our 20s, um, decided to challenge not only our bosses, but the way society regarded women and the roles women were to play. Um, and so I basically wrote it to say, this is your history, this is something you should know about, and you can benefit from um, seeing what it was like and what you need to do now. What I didn't anticipate was when I was writing this book that I would meet young women at Newsweek in 2010 who not only knew nothing about their history, but also were facing very similar situations as we were 40 years ago. And now it's a TV show, uh, which is going to get even much more attention, both to the book and you, but more importantly, to the issues it raises. Now let's take a look at the trailer for the 10-episode series for Amazon, created by Narcos writer and producer Dana Calvo and starving Anna Camp. News of the week is the first draft of history each week. Your job is to be fast and first and good and right. That's all we ask. It's like you guys are fighting over the lower bunk bed in jail. Who gets to make the guys who are writing the story look better? I 
used to hide in my eyes in the shadows stay blind to the light of day i don't want to just watch the news i want to feel a part of it i'm a career girl Woo! young lady could you give me a cup of coffee absolutely black two sugars yes there's great changes sweeping this country and it is so important that you're a part of it Nora, friend. Hi. Okay, you're not married yet, are you? Don't worry about me. I'm living my dream, too, just like you are. I can't give up on this story yet. But you're not a reporter. You're a researcher. And we had a date. Are you waiting to this day? I'm going out to make a change. I hope our kids look like you. Well, before we have kids, we have to have a marriage. <laughs> I'm going what the hell is this? This piece hit the bullseye. That was me. Girls do not do reruns. Why not? We have rules, protocol. This is ridiculous. I quit. Senior editors, all men. That's not fair. You're never gonna get your name on this page. You good with that? So powerful trailer, but inspired by real events, but not actually real events. The book is nonfiction. The television show is a hybrid, shall we say. How do you view the recreation of your history on television? Well, the storyline is pretty accurate. It is about a group of young women working at a magazine called News of the Week. Um, and the story of how they come to consciousness about their roles and what they should be and ultimately decide to challenge uh, the system at News Week is true. Um, I actually felt that the fictionalization was good, that they caught the spirit of it, and it allowed the writers to develop the characters much more fully. Um, there's no me there. Uh, most of the characters are completely fictionalized, um, except for Eleanor Holmes Norton, who was our lawyer, currently the delegate from the District of Columbia, and Nora Ephron, who you see in the trailer, who was uh, working at Newsweek early in the 60s, um, but left way before this action happened. And um, how true is it in terms of characterizing what life was like at the magazine at that point in time? Well, I think they did a pretty good job, actually. Um, I must say that the newsroom was historically accurate. When I walked onto the set, it was as if I was back at Newsweek in 1969. It was the steel desks, it was the Rolodexes, the dial phones. I mean, it was astounding. Manual typewriters, I Manual think. typewriters they got off of eBay. Um, they just recreated everything down to postage stamps with two cent postage stamps on it, uh, postcards. It was great. Um, and the costumes are wonderful and everything. But I think that the girls, uh, they're three main characters, and they each have a sort of particular role in society, as it was. There was there's a hippie girl. There's a sort of married woman who is uh, meant to get married and have children and leave her job. And then there's a kind of... Um, highly educated woman uh, from the upper classes who also, whose family's putting a lot of pressure on her to sort of find a good guy and get married and, and settle down. Um, from a marketing point of view and even from a critical point of view, people are writing about this and describing it as madmen through a feminist lens. Is that a fair characterization? I think so. I mean, what's wonderful about this story is it is female driven. The, the focus is on the women and how they decide to change the system. So in that sense, it's very female driven. What's also terrific is the entire production team is women. The two showrunners are women. The executive producer who found and developed the project, Linda Obst, is a very well-known producer in Hollywood. The set designer, the production designer, who is an, uh, nominated for an Oscar, she did Catch Me If We Can, and um, uh, Secretariat is a woman, this costume designer. So it's very interesting when I went on the set 
that people came up to me and said, it's so different being on a set that women are running. It's so much nicer and more collegial, and people aren't cursing at each other. It was quite interesting. Well, I, I, I won't debate that with you, because I've been on <laughs> mixed sets that are uh, not, don't have locker room talk in them either, but um, I'm sure it's a wonderful working environment, no doubt. Um, as you think about um, the show and how you expect it to be received, obviously it's going to be received in an unusual way because people will binge and people will come up to you and talk to you about the entire arc as opposed to one episode. Do you expect to get a lot of reaction from the media community and a uh, different kind of reaction than the book? Well, I think uh, it'll be interesting. You know, critics now, television critics, are going to review it as a piece of television drama. So, And in its entirety, at some level, without hopefully spoiling it. Yes, I think the um, they're actually getting the first six episodes, so they won't see the final episodes. So their early reviews will be based on the beginning and no, how the we're, we're develops. able to access all ten at now, one time, right? Now, when yes. It's out. yes. Yeah. So um, the early critics, though, I think it's going to be interesting to see what what they say. And then I think as people watch it, the question is, you know, you obviously want people to continue to watch it to the very end. And I do think they hook people um, a lot on the story. And I think the women characters are really strong. So I think from a, a people who are watching it, what interests me is women of my generation will say, oh, this is my story. You know, all of us have these kinds of stories, whether you were in the media or in advertising, or in corporate America, or anywhere. A any woman of my generation has a story like this. I'm really interested in young women, and I think the fact that these are young women who are starring in it, and the fact that we now are living in this political environment <clears throat> is going to make it even more relevant. That some of these issues that people might have thought, oh, that doesn't happen anymore. It's happening. We're talking about it. No question. Uh, one, of the, one of the many interesting backstories of all this is the fact that <coughs> your lawsuit was brought against the owner of Newsweek, the Washington mm -hmm. Post company, uh, where you worked, and I actually worked at one point in my career, uh, a company run at that time and for many years by a woman, Catherine Graham, and a company where your father, one of the greatest sports writers who ever practiced that craft, Shirley Povich, worked for decades. <laughs> There's family history and personal history in the whole storyline. How did you confront all that? Well, in the book, I just told the story of what happened. I, uh, I had to call my father to tell him that we were about to file this complaint. And he was working there at the time? And he was still working at the Washington Post as a sports columnist. Um, you know, he made his career uh, talking about how the Washington Redskins would never put any African Americans on their team. Um, and so he understood the sort of civil rights aspect of our suit. Once I explained why, he was very supportive. The only thing that concerned him, and he was very close to the Graham family and to Kay Graham, was that I personally be respectful to Mrs. Graham and that I wasn't being disrespectful. And I explained that it had nothing to do with her personally. In fact, as one of two publishers, she herself had received a lot of discrimination. One of two publishers? Of uh, women publishers. Women publishers. Um, the other being Dorothy Schiff, they often talked about the discrimination they received when they were with conferences of, of publishers, that they were only the first two women. Um, but I also wanted to be truthful about Catherine Graham, and she's a great hero in journalism and deserves to be. But she, as she said in her own book, was late to come to feminism, and she was not <coughs> supportive originally of when we first filed our complaint. Is she a character in the TV show? She's a character. She's nothing like Kay Graham. The woman who plays the owner of the magazine uh, is not at all like Kay Graham. In what regard, without giving away too much? She's, um, she's Southern. Uh, she's inherited the magazine. Uh, she's tough, but she doesn't have the kind of um, elegance and East Coast sort of propriety of Kay. Interesting. Well, we'll study that character as well. Many people will. Um, you, this cause of yours, uh, the advancement of women in the business world and in media, has manifested itself in other ways as well. You were a founder of the International Women's Media Foundation, a very important organization that's spoken out about gender issues now for many years. Um, how do you evaluate that as part of the kinds of things you've done around this issue? 
Well, you know, the thing about the Newsweek complaint for many of us is that it, for me personally, it set me on this path to decide to devote my energies to helping women, certainly women journalists, but that we really, there's so many ways in which women needed to break down barriers and get ahead. And I must say I was very proud of co-chairing the International Women's Media Foundation for several years, and I'm still very involved, to help women journalists around the world who face much worse conditions than we in the United States face. I mean, their lives are threatened, they can't practice their craft, their children and families are threatened, uh, they, are, they are assaulted, they're uh, shot at. I mean, they really risk their lives to report the news. And the International Women's Media Foundation supports them, trains them, gives them emergency money if they need it, medical care. So that is an organization I feel extremely strongly about and am very supportive of. And there are many organizations like that helping women around the world. I'm also on the Women's Division of Human Rights Watch, which we also do that for, uh, we do serious research about the kind of uh, discrimination that women face in countries around the world. So for all this important work, and for now, what I guess close to 50 years of being involved in this issue, the reality of the world we live in is that women run very few media organizations, and there exists something of a glass ceiling, and data supports that. How do you, as you look at the span of these years, certainly women have risen in the ranks and yeah. have many exciting jobs, and the political campaign season we're in now is loaded with young, aggressive, serious-minded women journalists covering the campaign, but still, that ceiling seems real. Yeah, it is. I mean, we, we broke down the barriers. They cover campaigns, they cover wars, they cover the president, not just the first lady. Women in journalism are doing very well, except at the top. There have been periods where a lot of women were running newspapers and news organizations, less in television, more in, in newspapers. It ebbs and flows, just like most industries. There was a period in Hollywood where women were running production companies. We are now in an ebbing period. There's hardly a woman now. I think there is one woman at NBC, but mostly there are not women running newspapers, major n newspapers in major cities now that I can think of. I think maybe the Cleveland Plain Dealer. But um, that's a problem, and I think for women in journalism, the problem has always been that we work in a very unpredictable uh, kind of profession, that news breaks all the time and you never know when you have to go someplace or cover a story or travel. And for people who want families or have families, it's extremely difficult to um, accommodate those needs. Nothing, and very difficult to change the culture of newsrooms, which continues to be very macho. I grew up in a newsroom. You grew up in a newsroom. Um, it is male-dominated. It is this sense that uh, you have to be there constantly, that the technology, which we were hoping would help many people in terms of flexible schedules, turns out to be more onerous than we expected. Because it's relentless. It's relentless. You're supposed to be there, on, uh, available online, you know, 24-7. So I think that one of our problems is that men continue to feel more comfortable around other men. Uh, men are often more willing to sacrifice their families to do these jobs and support their families. Women come up against a wall where the women who are talented and deserve to be promoted can't figure out how to be a good boss and a good parent at the same time. And their priorities often go to their families. So I think in order to keep and promote women, we have to change the culture, and that is extremely difficult to do. What, what does that entail when you say that? What do you mean in terms of family leave issues? I, th I think in so terms forth? of family leave, you're right. beginning to see even Wall Street firms offering longer family right. leave, paid leave. Um, but I also think that, you know, there have to be, we all in our generation sort of went into jobs during when our kids were younger and then went back full time when our kids were older. We had to sort of, we had no supports. I think that there are ways of using talents for short periods of time when women have very young children or giving men more flexibility for them to take on responsibilities. Um, I think people have to understand that they're going to lose, and they do lose, really talented, terrific people 
Um, and therefore, they lose different points of view. I mean, the thing that makes a great news organization is a diversity of views and a diversity of story ideas and a diversity of life experiences. And they're losing that. Let's uh, come back to Amazon for a minute because a lot of people are going to be introduced to the topic and your work through this TV series available October 28th and going forward on Amazon. One of the things Amazon does that's interesting is they, they test shows before committing to them, I guess in a fashion that nobody else does. So the pilot of your show was released some time ago and then they went through a process. Tell us about that process. Yeah, the pilot was put up with like six other pilots and people supposedly watched them and then voted. The Good Girls Revolt got a lot of votes and Amazon was very pleased. So they picked it up for 10 episodes, nine other episodes. And the pilot ran in November. In January, uh, they hired a writer's room of four or five writers. They wrote nine more episodes between January and April. They shot all nine episodes between April and the end of July. And it went up in October. So they work very fast. That's probably two or three times as fast as usual cycle on production of a series of this quality, right? I think so. For network, I'm sure it's it's a little slower. And what was your role? Were you official kibitzer or <laughs> what? Well, I'm a consulting producer, so I read the scripts. They interviewed, the writers interviewed me um, about what it was like then, and I tried to explain what was accurate, what characters would have done or would not have done, uh, the sense in the newsroom, the sense of what it was like to be a woman in the newsroom. Um, and I would send in notes, and as you know, as a consultant, some of them they listened to and some of them they didn't. Um, and so uh, I did go see the pilot being shot. I went out to Los Angeles. After the pilot was shot in New York, the nine episodes were shot in Los Angeles, and I went out to Los Angeles to see the shoot. And were you providing feedback along the way all the time? All the time. Certainly when I was reading the scripts, uh, I did, and when I was on the set, I did. Now, another one of the backstory pieces of this is the existence of the late Nora Ephron character in the show, who it's cast by, and what the, I guess, marketing thought is behind all that. Tell that story. Well, Nora Ephron, um, you can read the book to find the real Nora Ephron story, but Nora Ephron did, after she graduated from Wellesley, she came to Newsweek as a researcher in early 1960s, um, realized she would never be promoted to a writer, and left to have a very successful career beginning at the New York Post and then, as we know, becoming a filmmaker. Um, she left seven years before this actually happened. But um, the producer, Linda Obst, uh, had produced Nora Ephron's film Sleepless in Seattle. They were very close friends. Nora had died by the time that um, this project was being picked up. And so Nora sort of becomes an inspiration uh, in the series when, in fact, um, she was actually not there. But Nora is also a character in the film Heartburn, yes. which she helped create, well, a book that she wrote, obviously, and a film that was made about her marriage to Carl Bernstein yes. of Woodward and Bernstein fame. And tell us about the casting of Well, I that. think uh, Linda was very clever. Linda, Ka the Nora Ephron in um, Good Girls Revolt is played by a young actress named Grace Gummer who is Meryl Streep's youngest daughter. And Meryl Streep played Nora Ephron in Heartburn. And so the casting got a lot of publicity, which is great for the series. And you were pleased with that. I mean, it's positive publicity in all cases, right? Well, the it's, publicity. It's a, it's a ploy, and it's, it's interesting. And Grace Gummer is a fine actress yes, in her own right. She does a very good job. And that's, I guess that's all very clever and neatly Hollywood packaged. And you're supportive of all that. Well, I think it's, it's, I understand the marketing of it. I think that there's a real issue for those of us who were there to think that um, this actually arose by women who were working at Newsweek at the time. Who are given a fair amount of credit for yes. their, the work they did with you, right? Yes. And that's, that's properly depicted in the Yes, in they the did a very good job with that. And has that group of women stayed close? Are you... Friendly you know, with them? Or are you engaged with them? All of us have certain friends in this group. I mean, we ultimately ended up being over 50 women because the day after the day that we announced our suit, other women who hadn't had a chance to sign the complaint also joined. 
So we were over 50 women, and within those 50, we all had close friends. Um, I stayed very friendly with two of the people, um, and then, of course, connected with so many others when I went back to report four years later what happened. And um, we had many, we had a book party of just the women in the suit where we all came together again. It was like a big reunion. So it was a, it's been really nice. And how do you think they'll react to the depiction of their story? I don't know. They've been very supportive of the pilot. I've heard pe from people at the pilot. I think they thought the book was accurate. I mean, I always say, if you want the real story, read the book. Um, because that is the truest accounting that we could all remember 40 years later of exactly who said what and what happened. And I never heard anything negative about the book from, from my colleagues. Well, I think you're going to hear many positive things about the series if the trailer we just saw is any, exa any example. In the spirit of full disclosure, Lynn and I have been friends for uh, more than 30 years. We worked together in the early days of creating MSNBC and MSNBC.com. Proud to have you as a friend and proud to be able to help you tell the story, at least through Carpe Diem. So thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Merrill. It was my pleasure. Pleasure. If you'd like more information about this episode of Carpe Diem or any other Carpe Diem, you can write to us at the email address on your screen, carpe diem at mail.montclair.edu, or call us at 973-655-5158, or go to lynnpovich.com for more information about Lynn and this book. For Carpe Diem, I'm Merrill Brown. Thanks for watching.